I am, I am delighted to meet you. This is wonderful. You too. This is really wonderful. I've heard uh, that you do so much wonderful work. And I want to stay up front before we even get started that I'm really proud of you. Uh, of course, uh, being born in uh, polygamy is where I came from. So I truly understand uh, the chaos and the difficulty that's going on. And to think that you are actually helping people survive is what it amounts to, what it amounts to is survival. Uh, so I would like to know how you got started. I'd like to know some of the challenges that uh, you've been involved with and let people know what you need. So basically, I'm going to leave the format open to you because it's you that I want to know all about. Oh, you're so sweet. Well, first, I just have to say that sweet Kristen Decker just raves about you. And I really do appreciate what you do to get the, the word out and the, speak as the voices for the people that can't. Um, that's all super huge as well. So I cannot believe we have not met until now. That just completely dumbfounds me. And I'm so surprised by that. But at least we're connected at this moment. So that's wonderful. She tells me that you, uh, are you related to the Allred family? Mm -hmm. I am looking at my history. I'm actually from Nebraska. And I, I know I moved to Utah about 20, maybe 25 years ago. And my husband and I, we kind of joked about polygamy when we got here. Um, I even remember driving with my LDS realtor. And I didn't know anything about the, the LDS faith. I had a best friend in college that would say she's Mormon. But I remember driving with my realtor and I said, so what's this LSD thing? And she starts laughing. She goes, that's a drug. She goes, you meant you're, you mean LDS? And I said, yeah, that's LDS thing. And so um, she kind of shared about the culture here. And um, and then when we, you know, kind of talked a little bit, bit about polygamy, it wasn't, it didn't seem to be really prevalent here as far as I had learned. And boy, was I shocked. Like I had, I had no idea really the environment I was coming into. And so um, my husband and I, I had been diagnosed with cancer and terminal cancer in 2005. And when I was laying on what I thought may be my deathbed, I literally just said, God, if you give me an extra day, week, month, year, I will serve you boldly in whatever capacity you see fit for my life. I just wanted to be able to raise my three daughters who were one, three, and six at the time. And so two weeks later, I got off of that bed that I thought I was going to die on. I battled for a year. It came right back, battled again, only for a couple months. I've never seen it since. But through that process, we ended up moving into a larger house because we thought we were going to have a live-in to help me when I passed in with my kids. So now we have this large home where we're using 50% of it. So our family was self-sufficient upstairs and the basement had a, a mother-in-law apartment. It had a couple extra rooms down there as well in addition to it. And so when a friend of mine, a pastor friend of mine sent an email and said, hey, would you be willing to be a safe house for people leaving polygamy? I was like, huh, I remember looking up going, you know, it's kind of think of making meals or like washing, you know, someone's clothes when they had a baby. Like, am I supposed to move forward with this? I was a stay-at-home mom for 10 years prior to that, banking and finance prior. And I remember my husband and, and I sitting down and just praying about it and talking about it. And we thought, no, we need to do this. And so we said, yes, we received a family of six, two ladies who fled and one of the ladies, four children. Then the next, uh, they left after only a couple months. And then we had um, two families in, 16 people, 12 children in our home. Then we had another family. This went on for three years straight. And at that point, the first family came back and said, listen, um, we need help. And we believe 50% of our people would believe if they had a safe place to land. And so the, uh, they said, would you be willing to start a nonprofit? And um, at that point, my husband and I had just learned so much about this culture that we really couldn't turn a blind eye to it. And so that's how Holding Out Help started and HELP stands for Helping, Encouraging, and Loving Polygamists. So it was the buzzwords. If somebody was Googling or got it on their phone, it would pop our agency to the top so they would know where to call and to receive the services that we need. So that's how we got started, which is crazy, but that's the story. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. 
I had a few people call me because of a little bit of confusion about my identity. I used to, before I retired, I used to work as a property manager for a rather large uh, a corporation. And, and because I worked as a property manager, I handled all of their court cases. I handled uh, all of their contracts. I handled who was hired and who was not uh, for anything that was done on, on all of their properties. And right. so, be, so because I was constantly involved with something in real estate, some of my people thought that I owned all that real estate, which is a delightful thought, but... <laughs> yeah, <that's right. laughs> okay, so anyway, uh, when my, not very long ago, I retired. So I'm, I'm not working now. So my, my function to deal with real estate is no longer my job. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But you're still doing very important work. You're still well, bringing awareness to this. So Thank you. But when I quit working for them, I really quit working. And in, in other words, uh, that was in Northern California. Since then, I've, I've moved out of the state, followed my kids because mm -hmm. I'm a grandma, why, why not, right? So uh, I'm, I'm basically not working on a job period where I am literally employed. And uh, so, so now I just do what I do and what, what I'm compelled to do as you do what you're compelled to do. And, and so I wanted to explain that to you because I have had more than one person contact me and say, well, why aren't you putting up something? Now you know why. Because, yeah, yeah, yeah because the, yeah. <laughs> Can't put up somebody else's property. <laughs> That's right. That's right. You know, I'm glad you're in retirement. And I'm glad you're enjoying your grandchildren and your kids. I think that's yeah. Awesome. So, so, but you know, it, it has always been my intent to do everything that God would allow me to do mm -hmm. to set my people free. And that's exactly how I feel about it. That's wonderful. Uh, it's uh, it's bondage, it's uh, dishonesty. Uh, God hasn't got anything to do with it, uh, and uh, 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 I was born a slave, sold as a slave, and bred as a slave in the name of God. And there's thousands more like me. And uh, if if that's God, then there is no God. Yeah. Amen to that. You know, that's not the God I know, and I'm sure it's not the God you know. So, yeah. You know, so the Bible says God is love, and that has nothing to do with love. Absolutely nothing to do with love. Nothing to do with so love. So I want you to know that I really respect what you do, and I hope that this uh, helps to bring more people in. Uh, I try, well, actually, I succeed <laughs> in doing uh, shows not just on my Facebook, but I'm periodically on radio shows and other things. I work with other organizations. And I've been involved in that for a long time. I was area governor for Toastmasters International in the North. I spoke in many states. I wrote newspaper articles, uh, gave, gave speeches at universities, et cetera. So public speaking is not out of my line. So I decided to use that the best I could to help educate other people and to bring in people like you so people know you exist. The thing is this, if people know you exist and somebody is out there that has the capacity and the heart to offer what you need, that's exactly what we need. That's what this is for. Well, and I appreciate that because at the end of the day, you know, it's not about, it's not the time you tool shell. It is not about me, right? right? And the only way we grow and we are successful in rehabilitating some of the people that come from this culture is by the community that steps forth. I don't care what color you are. I don't care what religion you are. I don't, I don't, none of that matters to me. The reason we're in business for 14 years is because the word has gotten out through awareness and the community has come together as a whole to say, we want to make a difference. We had no idea this was this prevalent in our backyard. And so I love that you're giving me this platform. It's super humbling and I'm super excited to kind of see where it goes. So, well, I hope, I hope and pray that it goes a long ways because what, what you're doing is priceless. 
It's absolutely priceless. You know, giving people an opportunity and a right yeah. to have a loving God and have the courage to follow that path is more special than you'll ever know. We were born to blind service or else. Yeah. And it was the or else it was really there. Yeah, and you know, I you make a really good point, Rebecca, and you can probably say it better than anything, but I always try to explain what I've learned from all the families that were in my home, and this is the best way that I explain it, and I say there are people who are literally living under a dictatorship where every decision is made for them from what to watch, eat, read, whom they can associate with, even down to whom they can marry. Men or women don't usually own anything. You know, they wouldn't own their homes, they wouldn't own their cars, they wouldn't own, even in two of the communities, they have to account for the clothes on their backs. And if someone's more worthy or more in need, they'll ask you to give it up for the common good of the whole. There's very low education, which is a form of control. Our average education level that holding out help receives is the eighth grade maximum. And even the ones who, um, in one of the groups, they all come out with their degrees. But when I get them tested by a legitimate educational source, they're usually around the eighth grade still. Right. And, true. Yeah, and then it seems like sexual exploitation and um, trafficking, uh, labor violations are very normal, at least in the two main groups. And, and I think for me, Rebecca, what hurts my heart the most is that they believe this one man or woman, it's usually the men in there, can condemn them to hell or allow them to go to heaven. And so when they run, if they decide to leave, they know that they have chosen hell and to be in our world and that they're probably going to get used up very quickly. And that is the lack of hope that these clients leave with, or if they get kicked out. I mean, you can imagine you're like, oh my gosh, I just got kicked out. I have all these little children. We're all going to hell because I was disobedient. And can you imagine living in that darkness and that guilt of being responsible for all these little children underneath you? So I just don't feel like they can win. And the the rules of engagement in these groups seem to always be changing. And so they make sure no one can ever get their footing on what is expected. And so it's day by day, moment by moment. Am I going to, am I worthy? Am I not worthy? Am I going to heaven? Am I going to hell? And that's what breaks my heart the most. And so when we, when we get these clients, like we thought we were doing a service by putting a roof over their head. And we quickly realized they're very similar to refugees coming in from another country. And so we needed to have all the resources at their disposal. So the first would be, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, food, clothing, shelter, and safety. Those are the main needs so they can just come up and breathe and know that they're, they're okay. You guys are okay. And then we can start working on their future, whether it's education, counseling, job skills, life skills. It's usually all of those things and intense counseling. And so... I have to say, you're thanking me, but I, I'm. it's just such a privilege to be on the front lines of people that are so broken and to be able to say, that's not what I've learned in life. And there is hope and there there is opportunity and there is life outside of your closed polygamous community. And so I, I get to be on the front lines, which is super humbling and very exciting. I love it. I've got more friends in that from that culture than I do, than I do regular friends from the outside world. So I love what I do. Absolutely, I love what I do. Well, you're you're absolutely right on. We were taught to obey. Yeah. We were taught not to think. Number rule, rule number one: Thou shalt not think. Obey, no matter what. Shut up and obey, or you'll suffer eternal damnation because this man's a prophet. Yeah. And then as we grow a little older, we realize he's not only a prophet, but he's also a loss. <laughs> yeah. When did you actually leave? Like, what was your, what's your brief story? How old were you? How'd you get out? Uh, well, I don't want to waste my time on your interview. <clears throat> but uh, I, uh, my father was in prison in 1944, along with my father-in-law many other polygamists that promised never to live polygamy and they all lied or they, they all continued. Anyway, my father sold me for cash as a child bride 
Wow. To his to the son of one of his prison buddies. And I lived in constant fear. If I if I did anything wrong, he would waterboard my baby, and I'm sure he was going to kill her. So I lived in absolutely constant fear for a very long time. And uh, I, I, I wrote a book, it's called Born in Polygamy. And the caption is, I was born a slave, bred as a slave and sold as a slave in the United States of America, which is a fact. Yeah. And uh, how I got out, uh, it takes a long story of basically torture, punishment, child abuse, blah, 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 you name it all, you know. And finally, when my husband couldn't get me to uh, capitulate to basically the incest and everything that was going on, uh, he couldn't stand it anymore. So he drugged me, but he messed up. He drugged me so severely he couldn't wake me up. And then he got scared and thought I was going to die. And thought, well, if I did die, they'd run an investigation on him and he'd be in trouble. So he decided to take me to a hospital. I went to the hospital and uh, then somebody from upstairs stepped in. <laughs> For some unknown reason, I was assigned to the very best psychiatrist in the state of Nevada. Wow. I was in that hospital for several weeks. But while I was there, he bought me the little poem called the serenity prayer yes and he had me keep it and read it every day and he had me start to look at me and think and dare to think and be no matter what the consequences were and i can cut that story very short by saying he changed my entire life that is wonderful his name yeah. was dr jack jurasky and he informed my beloved husband that he had a choice he could either give me a divorce or he would turn him in for trying to kill me and he could face the consequences. I got a divorce. <laughs> yes. Woohoo! You know, what's crazy about your story is, you know, you think that a lot of that stuff has happened way in the past and all the things that you said are common still happening today. I did, I did a report for, um, channel 13 that I think will air next week. And it was about the law that took polygamy from a felony down to a misdemeanor. And he said, do you think it's helping? And all I could say was the pedophiles are still pedophiles. The abusers are still abusing and the traffickers are still trafficking. And until we deal with the systemic issue of these groups, we're doing nothing but perpetuating the problem. And so I'm interested in the kickback I'm going to get here in the Salt Lake Valley, but I can't sit on the front lines and hear these stories time and time again and not be bold about what I'm seeing. And your stories like the, the waterboarding, um, the beatings, the drugs that they're now giving people, um, you know, and there's this, this premise of when you have that person broken down, break them down further. So they're right. never able to speak to anyone in the outside world and tell them what is going on. And so the people that are flooding in our doors right now have dealt with so many different types of trauma. Right. It is hard to even get them stable enough to function, let alone to go to law enforcement. Like we don't put many cases before anybody because they're too broken to do it. And I would do more damage you know, pushing them in that direction. So it's so hard to find that balance on how do we, how do we stop this? How do we stop the systemic problem? And frankly, I think if Utah really understood, it's giving them a very big black eye. Polygamy has always kind of been in, the, in their, their background and their history. And, and what they're doing today is nothing short of evilness. It's power control, sex, money, Sure. Um, and, and it's drug trafficking, weapons trafficking, sex trafficking. It's all of those things that are happening in one. Well, it's, it's even more than that because uh, Herbal LeBaron was a mass murderer. Yep. He's my brother-in-law's brother. Oh, my gosh. Okay. So I've had friends and family killed and known about that kind of stuff and tried to escape it all my life. So it wasn't just me. Yeah. It was that I felt like I was living in a deliberately formed hell created by a power-hungry idiot. 
Just, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm trying to be polite. <laughs> sure. No, sure. I'm trying to be polite. However, I want to uh, in, invite you to uh, follow a show that I'm going to have on the 4th of next month. And we'll cut, and, and I will inform you of some things then that I really don't want to inform you of yet because I would like it to be a surprise to everyone. Awesome. Yeah. Wonderful. But, but and what I will day be, is that, you say? I will be speaking with a congressional judge from Congress. And I hope you'll find it very educating and useful to you and everybody else that's trying to make a difference in this world. And I want you to know, Rebecca, that if there's ever those opportunities, I'm happy to stand alongside of you and share our statistics and, you know, what I'm hearing and seeing with our current clients. I'm, I'm always on that team. People need to understand what is happening. Well, you know that there's so many lies going out that have gone out forever. They're saying, you know, these women have a choice. They have no choice. When my father was in prison, my future father-in-law actually sold, sold in a contract, his six-week-old baby as a child bride to one of his prison buddies. Wow. This has been going on all of my life. Well, and it's interesting because I'm, I'm, so I've been doing this 14 years, as I said, and I'm still learning. Like recently, I, um, I've been privy to some information and I can't give the details on why and where, but where these these women are telling us when the babe, when they get pregnant, that technically there was a marriage in the former life with this baby and a so-called man in their group. And so when the baby is born, they have the rights to molest and do whatever they want with that baby because that baby is going to be their wife here in our world when they get to age 14 or 15. And it's, I, we're hearing of all this kind of sexual abuse that's happening to these babies or young girls. And when they go to the leader to say, hey, this is happening, the leader essentially is saying it's justified because it's on paper that that baby is already married to that man. So he can do whatever he wants with that baby. And I'm thinking, is this really happening in my backyard in the United States of America? And it's, it's, it's hard to take. It's hard to hear. It's Hard to breathe some days, frankly. I, I, yeah, I'm aware of that. Now, we're going to go one step further. I want to tell you a little bit more about the incest. Yeah. We were taught from the time that we're born that we were taught that uh, incest is, it, it, as far as they're concerned, it, it isn't incest. It's very holy. Let me explain why. They teach us that uh, Jesus Christ was the result of incest, that Mary was God's daughter and God incested her to create Jesus. These men must incest their own children in order to become gods and raise a more holy seed like them. Now, I know this sounds terribly off the wall, but I actually have a quote from Brigham Young from the Journal of Discourses, and I think you can see behind me part of my bookcase. Yeah. My um, unusual illness is I'm a bookaholic. <laughs> my mom taught me to read. Reading, awesome. was, reading was my road to freedom. Yeah, it's power. Yeah, freedom. And I, I, I read all Mormon history, read the Journal of Discourses. I believe it's right here in volume one, Brigham Young tells about it's necessary to have sex with your own daughters, to have incest, to create somebody like Jesus Christ so you can become a god. Okay, girl, let's go to catch 22 on that. You're familiar with fumarous disease? No. Fumarous disease is caused from incest. Children born of it are frequently retarded mentally and physically. Some of them can never walk, but they bring in a much higher degree of welfare money than normal kids. Some people have told me they bring over $6,000 a month per child. I don't know. I, but almost every family I know has at least one child with boomerous disease from incest. How to spell that for me, H-U what? Uh, 
Fumer's, Fumer's disease? Yeah, how do you spell it? F-U-M-E-R-A-C-E, -E, I think. I never heard of that. Um, that's very interesting and yep. doesn't call, Some call it Fumer's deficiency. But, but the thing is the brain cells don't work right and you've got a retarded child. Uh, I'll send you some stuff on it later. That'd be great. Rebecca, are you part of All Red Group then? Uncle Rulin is my uncle. Okay. Christine's my cousin. Uncle Owen, her dad is my uncle. Yep. Yeah. Wow. Oh yeah. <laughs> That's insane. Wow, yeah. a, lot of, a lot of lineage right there, huh? Yeah. What are we gonna do when, when you're not here to be preaching all this stuff? <laughs> we need more people to come forward, right? We're gonna have a party. <laughs> Maybe, yes, no, maybe, a, maybe a complete community dance, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. I'll be dancing here on earth for you. <laughs> but, but, the, but, but the thing is that uh, having Herbal Libera, and of course, as, as my brother-in-law's brother, we're, we're accustomed to knowing that, uh, and when I say knowing, there's a reason I say knowing. I held up just for a second in the Journal of Discourses. Inside of these books, Brigham Young says, we have a choice. We can obey God's laws, the prophets that teach polygamy and all about it, or we can have our blood shed and suffer eternal damnation to save our souls. So they have a right to kill us. We're taught that from our birth. They have a right to murder us for disobedience. Well, and it's really interesting because we have lots of LeBarons right now, and I have one gentleman that is probably in his 60s, and he still can't sleep. And is still fearing. He said they were coming after him and his mother to kill him, um, and still fears that every day that they're going to find him. He has um, justifiable is, cause. What was that? He has justifiable cause to believe that. Yeah, and he, that's he's not imagining it. He's had enough family members murdered that he knows it's true. Absolutely, and I'm hearing that a lot from one of the other groups. Um, that yeah, they want to take us out because they don't want us to speak. Yeah, actually. The uh, degree of abandonment, hate, uh, any kind of negative thing they can think about you is so prevalent. Okay, my father had 39 children when I was a kid, married two more wives after he said he never uh, lived polygamy anymore after he got out of prison. So then 49 kids, okay. Of all of those 49 children, I have one brother that will dare to speak to me yeah it's so sad because i'm so wicked yeah i'm so wicked and uh people like me that say too much quite frequently just come up missing however i decided when i decided to do this i was going to do it anyway because i th felt like what if i came up missing in the process, I could probably save more lives than my one. Yeah. Okay, than my one. Now, I'm lucky. My children are all married normally. They all have an education that they wanted. They're all fine. And I love my children, but they don't need me. Yeah. My family needs me, whether they know it or not. Well, and I love your perspective because... As of recent, people are like, you know, they're going to take you out eventually. And I'm like, okay. Like I, my children, like you said, I've got one more that turns an adult next month and they don't need me. And if this means saving how many other lives, then so be it. I am at peace with it and I know where I'm going. So, so I'm a lot like you with that. I don't live in fear. Well, you know, the Bible said God is love. Yeah. And what's polygamy got to do with love? I can't even find it. Yeah, you can't even find it. Not for the women and the children. Not for anybody. It's based on greed and power. Period. Over and out. And I think it's good for your listeners to also realize that um, there are a lot of there's tons of corruption within these polygamous cultures, and there's hundreds of people corrupt. But then there's these thousands and thousands and thousands of followers underneath all that corruption that are born and bred and know no different. And they're living this because they genuinely think this is their way in order to be in the presence of God in the afterlife. And so I, 
you know, when I first started into this, I remember my husband and I said, we should just take them all out. Like, like that's how angry I was hearing about what was happening. But then we have innocent people like you, like Kristen Decker, like, you know, all these people that we've served that are literally living this with a genuine heart of just wanting to try to please God. And so I, I just don't want everyone to think that all people from polygamy are bad, right? Like they're all corrupt. They're all a mess. No, they are a mess, most of them, mm -hmm. but it's because of what the hierarchy and the system has done to them, not on their own accord, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I hope that makes sense. Sometimes I can't think of the right words to say, but I just think it's super important for people to realize that there's a lot of wonderful human beings that come from this culture, uh, thousands and thousands of them. Yes, they really are. And, you know, we were taught basically, thou shalt not think. Yeah. Women don't have the priesthood. You can't think. You can't make decisions. You have no choice. Just obey, obey, obey. Shut up and obey. Thou shalt not think. But every once in a while, something very strange or a tragedy happens in our life that causes us to think. Yeah. And that tragedy tells us beyond all doubt that God has nothing to do with it. Yeah. And that's what happened in my life. Yeah. You know, one of the most profound statements one of our clients said was, being in polygamy, we are not allowed to be human. No. And I thought that was so profound. I'm like, what do you mean you weren't allowed to be human? They said, we were robots. We had to do exactly what we were told the so, way we were told it to a team or there would be severe punishment and consequences that would come our way. Right. And I've always hung on to that whenever I do conferences, whether it's law enforcement conference, whether it's, you know, training social workers, um, I always use that statement and they're just like, wow. And so I, I want to get in more to the hospitals, right? And I want the hospitals to be aware when someone comes in like a Rebecca Kimball, they can see the signs and get them the best psychiatrist possible to get to the bottom of what's really going on to help protect and hopefully save them. Well, let me tell you the tragedy that saved my stubborn soul or made me realize it wasn't of God. The first, I'm going to call it my first, not only, first major turning point. Mm. My dad was married to two all red girls. And Aunt Rhea went back to Uncle Reuben because she preached all the time and could get women into polygamy. Mm. And dad and Uncle Reuben were enemies and dad hated Reuben beyond all doubt. Could never say anything nice about him. So he punished my mother and her children to get even with Uncle Reuben who was never there. So dad was an alcoholic and he was brutal. But Uncle Ruland decided that since daddy wouldn't pay him tithing, that he would have my mother marry someone else and have that man pay him tithing. So when I was nine years old, Uncle Ruland, uh, my mother had met a rancher out in Joab County. Uncle Ruland converted this rancher, had my mother marry him, and told this guy all about the uh, incest for godhood and all this sort of thing. So my mom marries this guy. I'm nine. The guy decides to rape me. I fight. He cut me up with his pocket knife. I'm still wearing the scars today. My oh. arms, legs, I've got scars, part of this eyebrow is missing. I'm uh, part of the, the, the cut through this cheek. I'm still wearing the scars today. He cut me up badly with his pocket knife because I fought and I fought. Wow. And I fought. But guess what? I knew at nine years old during that process, I knew, I didn't guess, that what Uncle Ruland had done, God had nothing to do with it. At nine years old. Wow. It was a major turning point in my life. Why do you I, think you fought and others can't? Like, like, where did your feistiness and resilience really come from? Because not many can do that. Well, this is, this is funny. It, it's actually so funny. It's probably not nice, but I'll tell you anyway. My mom was English. Follow the queen. Obedience, 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 obedience is all she ever knew. My dad was Swiss German. And I swear the only thing my father ever gave me that was worth having is his bull-headed Swiss-German personality. Yes. 
The only thing he ever gave me that, that I'm that I'm proud and thankful to have, because there was a point in me that said, "Go ahead and kill me. I'm not going there." <laughs> yes. And, yes. And, and 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 I was never the same. That was my first major turning point. And even though I was obedient and careful and cautious, I knew that what Uncle Ruland had done had nothing to do with God, nothing. And I was done with him altogether. But my mom did one very glorious thing for me. I'll thank her forever. She taught me to read. You can tell, right? <laughs> and my mom said, if you can read, and if you can do math, you can do anything. Yeah. It's up to you. Good for her. It's up to you. And for, for years, I ran television shows out of Northern California. I've done public speaking in many states. I've done uh, work for other organizations, an organization called Safe Kids Now to help protect children on the streets, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Because why? Because I believed her and I learned to read. Um, and the thing is, reading is priceless. Yeah. And to, peep, to keep wisdom away from people so that they don't think is a form of control. Yeah. Don't educate them. Don't let them know anything. That's, that's what I see. And, I, and as I explain it, it is. It's an absolute form of control because how do you go out into our society without any education? You can't read. You're not going to make it. And so if they don't land with an agency like ours that's going to say, no, 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 we're going to scoop you up, give you a safe place to be while we teach you this stuff, then they would be homeless. They'd be out on the streets. Exactly. Or, I mean, it, it's, just, it's just so heartbreaking and so... There's um, nothing, there's nothing you can't learn if you don't, if you really want to. Yeah. There's nothing. Yep. As long as there's books written about it and courses to take on it, nobody can stop you. Yeah. Nobody. Yep. And when people can learn that, then they start realizing, I have a dream. I have a wish. I have a hope. I have a prayer. Follow it. Yeah. It isn't in there for no reason. Yeah. It has a reason. It has a purpose. And, and, and that's just part of my library, you can see. <laughs> that's amazing. That's but, pretty cool. uh, but I I read, not just then and now, but always. If there's something going on that I want more wisdom on, I'm always researching it, and I read. And there well, is there is no end to what you can learn. But these people are afraid to learn because rule number one, when you're a little polygamous kid, thou shalt not think. Yeah. It's so sad, you know, uh, reading, uh, knowledge is power, I will say, and I wish everybody would do what you did because the evidence is out there. Right. The, the reality of, of what they were born and bred into, I mean, it's out there to be proven false. And so you just hope that they're smart or as bright or as dedicated as you are in order to actually figure that out on their own. I didn't really figure it out. I mean, I only got to thank my mom. My mom was a school teacher for what little schooling we had. And when she got away from the group, she, she taught school and she worked with mentally and physically retarded children. Aww. So she was very dedicated to humanity and education, not in what she spoke out in the public, but what she did every day. Yeah. So that's a gift from my mother. That's wonderful. Now I know why you and uh, uh, Kristen have turned out so well, right? <laughs> so, you, you have, do you have different moms, I assume? Are you? Yeah, we, yeah we're cousins. We're cousins. Cousins, okay. Uh, for but, some but reason. The thing, the thing about Kristen that's uh, blessed, a godsend, is she always had a heart that couldn't be damaged, crunched into the ground and buried by somebody else's anger and abuse well i'm it's absolutely amazing it is and i'm so always so impressed with her because she still this breaks her heart of what people are living in and going through but she doesn't yeah she gets i mean we all get justified anger sometimes but she still keeps that compassion and that softness and that caring side to her where a lot of people become bitter and angry and and they're the ones that end up in jail because they're, you know, quick to beat someone up out here or, you know, don't look at me funny or I'm coming after you because they, they dealt with that their whole lives and they're like, we're not going to deal with it anymore. So she's been great in finding, I guess, that really healthy balance of wanting to speak up about 
you know, this, this issue that we have in our backyard, but still keeping that softness, compassion, and love for everybody, for every human. I know her and I, we don't always think exactly alike, but she adores me and I adore her. You know what I mean? We well, still have respect and love for one another. Well, here's the thing about Kristen that's beautiful. She knows because of the path we walked as children that these people can only operate on what they know. Yeah. That's phase one. Phase two, they don't know much. <laughs> and yeah. she knows that. So she allows phase two to take its, its blunt edges and affect phase one. And no, they wouldn't do that if they knew better. Yeah. And they that, really that, don't. They really don't. Up, I agree with you. It brings up such a good point because I always say the analogy of, you know, we raise our children from the moment they're born and they're they're having choices every day in front of them and as parents we allow them to make a choice but we also allow them to suffer those natural consequences of their choice well people coming from polygamy never have that opportunity so when we get somebody whether they're you know 15 years old or they're 35 years old you got to look at them like a five-year-old child and so i say don't make the decisions for them if, for example, they're in a host family, so we have host families that raise minor children, and, and I say, you know, you ask them, do you want chocolate or vanilla ice cream? And they're like, their famous words, I don't know. They really don't know. No. I say, that is legitimate. Don't let that frustrate you. Instead, give them a scoop of each. Put it in their bowl and say, here you go, and then ask them the question, which one did you like best? And that gets them thinking, or... If they say, I want to go on a date with this boy that I met online that is 40 years old and the kid's maybe 15, you know, obviously you just don't let them go. But you sit down and you talk about the pros and cons of what could happen in those situations. You evaluate what it is and you say, and you hopefully allow them to get to the decision of, oh, that's not a safe option and this is why. You've got to get them thinking for themselves. You can't make these decisions for them. And so it's teaching just like you teach a child all the way up. And so I tell my therapists, I tell the, our counselors, uh, or not our counselors, our case managers, our tutors, you know, give them options. And no matter what option they pick, say, okay, we're going to go down this path and then let them learn from the path that they went down, even if you don't agree. And so it's, it's teaching a child. It, it, it is what it is. I don't care if they're 40 years old. We're, we have to teach them to make these decisions and healthy decisions. But you're, them. you're teaching them something that they have been told they can't do. Thou shalt not think is rule number one for polygamous kids. Shut up, obey, thou shalt not think. And that's why it's so important for us to give them a voice, right? No, you are in control now. You get to make decisions. You have a voice and you get to decide what your future looks like. We don't get to decide what your future looks like. You get to decide what your future looks like. And we have way more success that way than saying, no, you should probably go to college. You shouldn't, you shouldn't drop out. You should, you should, you know, don't drop out of high school, go finish high school. You know, we don't say that if they drop out, okay, they might be out for a year and realize they can't get a good paying job. And when they come back to us and say, gosh, you were right. We're the first ones that's going to scoop them back up and say, okay, let's help with next steps and let's get you going. So they have yeah. to learn. Yeah, have to so you're, you're really, you're, re you're really doing a beautiful job because if you can really grasp it and it's hard because I don't know any other culture except the one that I came from where the basic rule of life, especially for women is thou shalt not think. Yeah. You yeah. do what you're told, shut up, and thou shalt not think it's none of your business. Yeah. It's so hard because the value and the worth of a woman is right here, right? right. What, how many kids can you bear? What do you have to offer to your husband, right? And you've got to do exactly what you're told. And you, it's ingrained and it's learned from birth. So you don't know anything else. So when they come out into our world, they don't know their favorite food, don't know their favorite color. They can't open a checking account. They're paralyzed in fear of decisions. And so it's wonderful when they step into an agency like ours, because they're going to have that support system. They're going to have that case manager that says, I'm here with you. I'm, I'm not going to leave you. Let's, let's just walk down this road together one step, one decision at a time. And pretty soon one day they wake up and they're like, wow, I'm making healthy decisions. I have a good life for myself. I have a voice. I get to decide what I like and what I can do and what I don't want to do for that matter. I had one of my clients say it very well. She said she was a, she was a bride at the age of 14 and her husband was in his forties. 
And she said, you know, as she said, I was the, I fulfilled his sexual fantasies. And she said, as long as I lived within the parameters of the box that he set out for me, I would receive some love from him. But if I stepped outside of that box, everything was taken away. And I thought that was so powerful of, wow, she was given this little box and she had to work within those parameters for her to get love, for her to get proper care. Again, she's a 14 year old child. And that 14 year old child became a 14 year old mother of all of his other wives and all these other kids, right? And so I, I just always love that analogy is she just had this little box. <laughs> But once she went outside of it, all hell broke loose. It could be abuse. It could be neglect. It could be sexual torture. It could, you know, it could be all these other things that would happen to her. So sad. Well, rule number one, you know, for polygamous kid, thou shalt not think, just obey. Yeah. And, and so when you can get them to cross that bridge, in, even in the smallest way, to imagine that it's okay to cross that bridge and to be responsible for that decision, that is a landmark thing yeah. to do. That's a yeah. landmark thing to do. You know, mostly in, in our family, my father spoke and we shut up and listened. We had no voice. Yeah. It. So sad. You know, there, you know, we had never had a voice. It was yeah. obey or, you know, or else. Yeah. And, you know, my, my older brother, Roger, uh, you know, uh, was out working and whatnot and, uh, trying, you know, Dad was probably drinking somewhere. I don't know where dad was because he really had an alcohol problem. But my brother Roger was out working in the fields. And uh, dad got upset about something and went out and beat Roger with the two by four and he broke his legs. Because that's what what... The two by fours. I hear this still to this day all the time. A two They're... by four is a board that if you turned it sideways and saw the end of it, it would be four inches across this way and two inches this way. And if it's a long, it can be six feet long. You've seen a hundred of them, you just don't know it. Well, and I know what a two by four is, but I, I'm like, why two by fours? Everyone gets beaten with two by fours. Because and that's just, what they had. That's just what they had. That makes sense. That's because, what they had. So sad. So that's what sad. they had in the back of the truck to jack it up or whatever the little problem was, because two by fours are not hard to get. Yeah, it's so, so sad. So that is what they had. But the thing is this, that this somehow is considered holy and righteous. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you had to bring them in line, but I think they took that, uh, the Bible scripture to an, uh, they took it to an extreme, you know, what is it? Um, it's with the rod. I can't think of it now, but, uh, my rod, my staff. Rod, spare the rod, spoil the child. And so they feel justified in doing that. And again, you're supposed to produce soldiers, right? People that just follow suit and do whatever you're told so if you're not doing that like in the FLDS they have what's called repentance homes and we've we've had boys that have one of the one of the homes actually got raided out in Idaho and I had a 16 year old boy that had landed on my doorstep and he wouldn't really look at me in the eye and I could tell something was wrong with his eyes and I I uh, I was helping his brother at the time and when I asked him, first of all, I said, would you look up, would you look at me in the eyes, son? And he, he did. And I said, what happened to your eyes? And he said, well, I was bad. Of course, he's already hard on himself. I was bad. And I rode a four-wheeler and it flipped up on top of me and it damaged my one eye. So the other eye, uh, other eye twisted to compensate. And I said, how long ago was that? And he said, four years ago. And I said, why haven't you gotten your eyes fixed? And he said, my father didn't think I was worthy enough. Well, within that, um, around that time frame, a 13 year old boy was dropped off at my front doorstep, like at my house. I've never had kids dropped off at my personal home. Didn't recognize the man who dropped him off. I've never seen him before. And this boy looked severely malnourished. And we invited him obviously into the home. It was 3 a.m. in the morning. And um, as I'm chatting with this kid, I realize he's from the same repentance home as this other boy was in. And he shares with me the abuse, the two by fours, the PVC pipes that he was beaten, um, sent out in, in horrible weather um, where he broke into some guy's trailer. And that's all I could think about was, I'm going to hell because I stole a jar of peanut butter out of this guy's trailer. And he can't stand peanut butter, I don't think, to this day. But I'm like, he was surviving. And the guilt that he felt, well, because both parents were deemed unworthy. So this 13 year old boy's parents were deemed unworthy and sent away. And so nobody had contact 
for the parents. And that's the first, um, that's the first call we make when we receive a child is to the parents. We're like, you're the parents. I'm going to treat them with respect. Your child's landed here. You know, we want to invite you into this process, decide what's next um, that we can do with the child. Well, we had nobody to call, so we had to call authorities because he was on 13. And so we called authorities. Um, FBI was on my doorstep that next morning. He drew a map and they went to the house and they raided the house within probably 20, not even 20 hours. And when they went in, there was no refrigerators or freezers. There was no food in the cupboards. Um, the caretakers, what they call it over, there was nine boys in this home and all under what's called a caretaker and separated from their biological parents. They went up to the caretaker's room, which was locked. They busted through the door and there were the refrigerators and freezers all lined up in the caretaker's room with padlocks on them. And, and then I was told that the boys, one of the boys was locked in a furnace room for three days straight. Um, just the, the, what was happening to these kids is just so horrific. And how they found me was pretty ingenious because the caretaker would leave often. I don't know if he was going to see his wives or just going to town to hang out, drink, I don't know. And the boys would walk down the road. Uh, so they had these homes out in the middle of nowhere. So nobody knows what's going on, but these boys, knew there had to be neighbors somewhere. So they went down and found a neighbor and they did some yard work for him to get money. And then they went to a quick shop, they bought a track phone and they called our agency through the track phone initially. And I remember when I got, it was two 13 year old boys and I want to say a 14 year old boy. And they're like, can you come pick us up in Idaho? And I'm like, I can't, you know, that's kidnapping. I'm like, are you guys being hurt? No, we're not being hurt. And so there's very little you can do with that because they don't even know what abuse is it was so normal so they didn't know being hit over the head by two by fours being starved uh, not getting medical care for the eyes they didn't even know that was neglect or abuse um and so through that whole process the state took them all into um, their custody we had a big court hearing all the little polygamous mothers came um, and the courts essentially let every one of those kids go back to their mothers who sent them back into repentance homes who within the, the next two years, every don't, kid. Don't you love us? That's welcome to my holy family. Zero justice, zero justice. Zero, absolutely. You and know, we, the thing is, the thing is we're, we're, we're about in an hour. So we're going just, to, I, I, I'm not sure exactly. I think we started a couple of minutes late. We're good. But, but what I'd like to do with you is I want to do this again because you were wonderful. Oh, you're you, so you, you can continue to bring, see a lot of people say to me, well, you've been gone for so many years, you don't know, yeah. but this has been going on so since happy. my grandfather's day, since before I was born, and it, and it goes on and on and on and on, because it works. Yeah. It's amazing the crime that can be committed in the name of God, and as long as it's done in the name of God, people just don't look. Yeah. And, you know, uh, you're an angel, girl. <laughs> Stay with it. And uh, and I and I want to schedule another one with you. And you can think and you can think over anything you want it to be. But I believe that what we have said today. That you've made people realize this is still going on. The thing is that, you know, my father sold me for cash because I wasn't a human being. I was property. Yeah. Women are property. They're still property. They're breedable property for more, for more breedable slaves. Yeah, yeah no question. And, uh, bless you for all you do to bring awareness. You are so brave and so courageous where so many don't have a voice or too scared to speak up. And if I can help you down the road, let me know. And I, I think, I think you're helping just, tremendously and you're so good. I, I do want you back. Uh, the thing is, you, you're, you're really special because sometimes from where we come from, you've got people that are stubborn like Kristen and I, and we're going to do whatever we can do. But there are very few people that come from the outside and can see yeah. what's really going on here. Yep. Can absolutely see what's really going on here. You know, if God is love, it has there's there that has nothing to do with polygamy, uh, selling your children, breeding children like cattle, the extreme incest and deformities and the money they pull off the United States in many, many forms, not just from welfare, 
but it, if you do a if you do a, a money statistic thing, it'll blow your mind. I've got a lot of stuff on that too. That they get money from all sorts of things, and the family never gets it. They're still slaves. Okay, absolutely. Yeah, I just, yeah. I, I appreciate so much that what you're doing. Uh, I'm going to vote for you no matter what you're running for. <laughs> oh, I never wanted to be out in front of people. I wanted to stay behind <laughs> all the trenches, but I didn't know when you started a nonprofit, you need to also be the face. And so, uh, yeah, <laughs> I didn't know it before. I wouldn't have the courage to do it. So thank you for the vote of confidence. And uh, I appreciate your show and everything that you're doing here with your just bringing awareness. So. But you know, the thing is this, even though you, you don't know you're running for, you're a winner, girl. And oh, you're a winner and uh, don't make me cry Rebecca Stop. Yeah, uh, well I just could I feel like reaching through through the screen and hugging you I just do it God bless you thank you thank keep you it up so and, and we will do this again yeah look forward to it okay thank yeah, you yeah. okay, okay.